So again, uh, I don't have to speak, which is cool. Um, just gonna watch and enjoy the beautiful work that uh, all of you have been doing. And to summarize the semester, really enjoyed uh, last Tuesday and looking forward to uh, hearing y'all today. Who's, uh, who's first that can? Uh, the Any first group is Any announcements? No, let's sit, yeah. Oh, I guess just for the people who are going to post on Wikipedia, I created the grade scope um, assignment. So please post them there. I think I set the deadline to like um, Sunday, but you know, try to do it as soon as possible. Um, yeah, and then the first group for today is Michelle, Emily, and Kathy. And I'll try to warn you guys. Um, yeah, I'll try to warn you guys when you have two minutes remaining. Cool. So uh, then I will share my screen. Okay. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, our project was on evaluating fMRI sequences, and our team was uh, me, Michelle, Kathy, and Emily. Great. Um, so this is an image, um, and this is analogous to the kinds of things we've been looking at for the majority of the semester, uh, structural magnetic resonance images. However, when you add another dimension, being time, um, you're taking multiple images over time, so you add another dimension, but you also get a lot more information about what's happening. So before we only saw a cute kid, now we see a cute kid falling. Um, so clearly very important. Um, great, so with functional magnetic resonance imaging, it's a non-invasive method of studying the involvement of different brain areas in different perceptual and cognitive functions by taking multiple measurements over time. Um, so from this, we've been able to determine broadly that cognition and action is processed in the frontal lobe, sensory integration is processed in the parietal lobe, and vision is processed in the occipital lobe. Um, but there's a lot more information that we know that I'm not including now. Um, but what are we exactly measuring when we're getting these functional magnetic resonance images? We're looking at the blood oxygenation level uh, dependent or bold contrast. So we're assuming that there's this relationship between neural activity and oxygen consumption, and then that increases the amount of blood flow that is brought to the neural tissue. Um, so we're looking at the two kinds of molecules, uh, specifically hemoglobin. We're looking at oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin, and they have different magnetic properties. So oxyhemoglobin is uh, diamagnetic, so it doesn't kind of disrupt the magnetic field. But the deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic, which has this induced mag magnetic field, which disrupts the spins and decreases the amount of signal in a voxel um, when there's more deoxyhemoglobin. So we can use this kind of uh, concentration relationship to figure out what the bold signal is in a specific voxel. So when we have more oxyhemoglobin, we have more signal, um, and we get this kind of delayed hemodynamic bold response. So of course, when we're taking multiple images, we all have to make a few trade-offs. So the top images are all T1 weighted structural images where we're prioritizing having a good contrast between gray and white matter. Um, in the bottom where these are functional images, we're taking multiple over time, they're T2 star weighted, um, and we want to prioritize imaging qu quickly and having a good bold contrast. So a pretty common structural image and the one that we used for the images or the data we are talking about today is 3D MP rage or magnetization prepared rapid gradient echo. Um, basically there's this preparation pulse where you can figure out uh, what contrast you want to prioritize. So in this case, again, we're doing T1 weighted contrasts. We have our pretty standard acquisition sequence and then some sort of recovery sequence, a recovering uh, period. Next, in the functional images that we're going to be talking about, we use gradient, or the people collecting the data <laughs> used gradient echo pointer imaging, where it's similar to the 2D FT that we've talked, a lot, talked about a lot during the semester. Um, but instead, we're taking multiple readout gradients or multiple readouts uh, with one excitation uh, pulse. So we, it's a lot faster. We're able to scan um, a whole brain in a couple of seconds. However, the long readout means there's a little bit more noise and a lot more artifacts. 
So since, again, with fMRI, we're trying to prioritize and taking a lot of images. Um, we want high temporal resolution or as high temporal resolution as we can get to understand perceptual and cognitive things that happen in a short time scale. Um, so one way that people have proposed um, improving the efficiency is with simultaneous multi-slice or multi-band imaging. So in the top left, you can see there's this complex RF pulse, which is essentially just the summation of several standard RF pulses with different phase offsets. Um, each of those individual RF pulses uh, targets a specific, uh, has a specific resonant frequency and targets a specific Z slice um, as shown in the image. Um, and then the specificity, specificity of the RF coils um, in combined with the phase offsets induced by this multiplexing in the sequence um, allows us to have uh, image this acquired sequence with uh, slices overlaid, um, but then it, we're able to separate them um, with different reconstruction methods. So the stimulus for the fMRI experiment that we used was called audiovisual SNR or AVSNR. It's a video that is about two point two and a half minutes long with scenes and sounds that are designed to activate visual and auditory cortex. The videos contain naturalistic moving scenes and sounds as well as songs and music. So on the right, that's not actually our AVS and our sequence, but it's kind of what it feels like when you're in the MRI. The subject's task was to view five repetitions of the stimulus while in a 3T MRI. The AVS and our stimulus was presented while scanning with eight different sequences spanning the multiband factors two, three, and four. Different voxel sizes were tested with the multiband sequences uh, including 2.2 millimeters, 2.5 millimeters, and 3 millimeters. Each sequence and its parameters have an effect on the SNR that we are expecting. Here we're showing the same table as before, where now entries are colored in red where we expect to see high SNR and blue where we expect to see lower SNR comparatively. A shift from blue to red from left to right is based on our expectation that an increase in voxel size results in an increase in SNR, because more spins will be excited per voxel. We also expect sequences with a longer TR to have a higher SNR. And finally, we expect sequences with a higher multiband factor to have a higher SNR because SNR improves with the square root of N where N is the multiband factor. The interactions between these parameters affecting SNR are really complex and we'll kind of show you this. And so we have multiple metrics we use to compare them. So there are three main metrics that we were looking at in our analyses. Um, they're called temporal SNR or TFNR, time port correlation TP core, and explainable variance EV. So what at a high level each of these metrics are trying to get at is how good is the signal you're getting from these different scanning sequences. And they just capture that information in different ways. So the first one that we're going to talk about is temporal SNR or SNR which um, intuitively is most similar to the measure of SNR that we talked about during class. Um, but instead of taking the value of a signal over the standard deviation over runs, um, you basically just compare the mean of the time series over time um, over the standard deviation. And uh, the way this metric works is that if you have a very high value, then that's indicative that the amount of noise relative to the average activation over time of your voxel is low, which uh, is more similar to what you would want. Um, the second one is called time point correlation. And intuitively, what you're trying to get at here is how specific is the activity at each time point. So for instance, if your MRI scanner were to produce a signal of zero at every point in time, then that's not very helpful because your signal is not very indicative of what the brain is actually doing. So what you want to do is you want to know how well can you guess what time point of the stimulus you're at based on the pattern of voxel activity. And the way that works is you say you have n runs, you split the n runs into n minus one training runs and one test run, and you average the data from all the n minus one training runs, and from both the average train runs and the test run, you select a subset of voxels. And you look at, um, based on the activation pattern of each time point in the training run, how well can you guess which time point you're at in the test run. And um, Similar to TSNR, uh, you want this value to be higher as a measure of better signal from your TL. Um, and the last metric we looked at is explainable variance. Um, and what this one is supposed to capture is the correlation of brain responses between runs. And um, 
if so what Spencer captured is that if your brain activity is completely uncorrelated across different runs, then uh, the this metric will give you a value of zero. But if your uh, data is giving you exactly the same measurements across different runs, then uh, this metric will give you a value of one. So again, higher is better in this case. So now we can kind of go through the results that we have after applying all of these metrics. The first that we're showing here is temporal SNR. So here we check the temporal SNR of different fossils within a specific multiband factor. So here each figure so shows a histogram where the x-axis shows the temporal SNR. And remember here, higher is better. And the y-axis shows the number of voxels with that T-SNR. And here each plot, again, just shows one multiband factor. Oh wait, yeah, and the different voxel sizes. And here it's really cool because you can see a more clear trend where there are more voxels with a higher TSNR when the sequence is run with a larger voxel size. So this is cool because this is what we expected. But when we compare multi-band factors while holding voxel size constant, we see a more complicated relationship between TSNR and multi-band factor. So in the first two figures with showing lower voxel sizes, the TSNR values across the voxels are very similar. When you get to three millimeter voxels, there seems to be some kind of trend where a lower multiband factor results in a higher TSNR, but it's not as clear as what I kind of just showed you before with voxel size. Um, and here, multiple factors are in play. There's the square root of n uh, SNR increase with an increased multiband factor. There's the uh, low decrease in SNR with a lower TR length. And so our conclusions are that the, there's further work that needs to be done to get a better understanding of what the relationship is between temporal SNR and multiband factor when voxel size is held co constant. So now we're looking at the time point correlation of the sequences, which is again kind of how specific is the signal at each time point. Um, so ideally we were looking for a tall, high, tight peak um, so a small full width half maximum value, um, because this means that information across time points is unique. So first we looked at the TP core of different voxel sizes. Um, no, yes, of different voxel sizes within multiband factors. Um, and we see that the temporal specificity of voxel sizes 2.5 and 3 are pretty similar, um, but we get a marked improvement for 2.2 millimeter voxels. Um, when we compare within voxel sizes, uh, so this is two point, the first is 2.2, 2.5, and then three, we see that we have more temporal sp selectivity for smaller multiband factors. Um, in general, uh, it might be interesting to look and see if slice timing correction as a pre-processing step is contributing to this at all, because when we're looking at uh, such a small time frame, it really does matter when we are collecting these different slices along the z-axis. Um, and then the last comparison we'll talk about is uh, the explainable variance metric. So um, like before, first, we're comparing uh, within each multiband factor. So if you change the voxel size holding multiband factor constant, um, how does the distribution of EV change? Um, and on the x-axis is the EV value, and the y-axis is the number of voxels at that EV value. Um, and in general, for at least for multiband factor two and three, as we go to higher voxel sizes, um, the distribution of EV, the mean is shifted to the right, so towards higher EV values. However, for multiband four, um, uh, the multiband four three millimeter sequence gave us on average a lower EV value. And uh, like Michelle said, there's probably more analyses that we should do to figure out exactly why. Some possible um, reasons are just because of some, like there might actually be some real difference in terms of the multi-band four or three millimeter sequence, but also there's probably, um, we're gonna look at the uh, pre-processing the data. And for instance, like if the subject just happened to move for more during this sequence collection, that would also have contributed to a lower average EV value. Um, and then this is just uh, the same thing, but instead of comparing across, multi, um, across different voxel sizes, we're comparing across multi-band sequences. And we see a similar trend in which, or like in general, as you go to a higher multiband factor, then the EV distribution gets shifted to right. But again, for the multiband four, three millimeter sequence, um, it kind of breaks that trend. And we don't have a very good explanation of why at this point. Um, so, so far we've basically just been showing distributions of 
values for these various metrics um, over the different voxels, but it's also useful to know which parts of the brain are having good like GP correlation or explainable variance or um, temporal SNR. So one way you can visualize it is to look at, um, basically you plot these metrics onto a flat map of the brain. So what this is showing is that if you take your brain and kind of like cut along the middle and take a Mercator projection of what your brain looks like, um, this is what it would look like using that projection. And here we're plotting the EV value for each voxel um, and more towards yellow means a higher EV value and more towards black is a lower EV value. So this in particular is showing the EV value distribution for multi-band four um, three millimeter voxels. And because this was an ADSNR experiment, we expect um, higher EV in like auditory areas. So auditory cortex, which is here, and also in the visual, visual cortices, such as here, which is kind of what you see. And um, one thing that's interesting is if you compare this um, EV flat map with so if you look at, for instance, like Broca's area here between this one, this is like the overall lower EV flat map, and then the next one, which is the higher EV flat map, even though the multi-band three, three millimeter sequence was producing higher EV overall um, in Broca's area in particular, it's um, producing substantially lower EV. And the reason that's interesting is that uh, in general, we would expect Broca's area to um, contain more high level semantic information. So, um, I mean, this might just be like, by accident, and again, we don't really have the explanation, but it seems like even though overall this um, multi-band 4 3 millimeter sequence is having lower EV, it's maybe having better EV for the, like whatever semantic content is in these videos. Oh, sorry, just two minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, kind of like from the, the end of our presentation, uh, we know that the multi-band sequences offer many benefits for functional MRI. They have a shorter uh, TR, they have little to no SNR loss and are very useful for measuring dynamic functional activity with, uh, at shorter time courses. Um, from the uh, measurements that we've made based on the different sequence parameters, we kind of conclude with the temporal SNR that larger voxels do result in higher TSNR. There is a complex relationship between multi-band factor and temporal SNR that probably will require more work to, to figure out. Um, for TB core measures, there is a the lower multi-band factor sequences have a higher temporal specificity. Um, and then there's a, an improvement for 2.2 millimeter voxels across multi-band factors. But then for 2.5 and 3 millimeter voxels, they're about similar. And then for explained variance, uh, explainable variance, there's a nonlinear effect of voxel size and multiband factor. So our results aren't completely conclusive. There is still a lot more work to be done, um, but this is kind of what we wanted to show you today. So thank you for listening. These are some references. Uh, questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, did you guys collect this data or did you find like a data set online and do all the processing? Uh, it was collected by previous members of our lab. So we oh, pre-processed cool. it, um, but I don't think it has been used for I think, yeah, they were also testing sequences. Got it, cool. I have a question. Um, you said that you expected the SNR to be higher with a larger multi-band factor. Can you explain why? Uh, so from a paper that we read, uh, the paper essentially said that there would be like a square root of N increase. Um, it is what? at a loss for me right now as to exactly why, but. Uh... Yeah, I'm actually wondering why, because uh, for example, if you would collect one slice at a time, uh, you'd spend exactly, you know, whatever time you spend, you know, it takes time to collect that data one slice at a time. So you would get like a certain amount of SNR, but now, um, I guess if you collect three slices, like three slices at the same time, 
The question is, are you going to collect more images? Like improve your temporal resolution. And if not, then you shouldn't get more SNR. But if you just get this one image, then the SNR should be the same. Because uh, you spend exactly the same amount of time uh, on each slice. So if you do any, if you have a higher temporal resolution that you gain from that, then that can give you SNR boost. If you're not having any temporal resolution improvement, then you don't. Um, if you if you see what I'm saying, uh, what, what I mean. So is was was the was the temporal resolution that was acquired the same for them, uh, all multiband? Uh, I believe they were all different. So here, just like the the scan times for higher multiband was significantly shorter. The temporal resolution, you say. And, um, uh, but then did, did you perform any temporal averaging or something like that? Or temporal filtering? Because without that, then you cannot gain that, that SNR. Um, so we, before computing the metrics, we did resampling. So um, to have, so we ended up with the same number of samples because the stimulus is the same amount of time. So we ended up with the same amount of samples. Mm. So I'm not exactly sure if that resampling, if there will be other effects, but there will be more like sam like images per resampled step for shorter TR. I see. So right. So I think it should probably depend on the how you do the resampling too. Um, that can maybe it has an effect on your results. Um, the other thing is maybe that you haven't considered there is a G factor that was not taken into account. So when you accelerate by a factor of four with multiband, G factor can also give you a, a cost, right? So while you may gain some SNR, like a SNR as well as temporal resolution, but you might lose it because of the G factor. I don't know if that's a huge problem for, but multiband four maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, there's the, also the issue with the, uh, you, you, there, there might be effects related to the really long RF pulses that could also cause some of this SNR loss. Um, because multiband, you know, requires longer RF pulses because you have to, and, and more power. So maybe that could also be an attribute, but that's very interesting. Thank you. Any more questions? I can ask a question. So um, I guess in the last part, when you guys were showing the images and like looking at where, um, where there was like higher SNR uh, relative to like different regions of the brain, did you like consider kind of um, calculating those metrics maybe separately for different regions? Um, and then like trying to compare with that instead of like just calculating um, it for like all of the voxels? Um, across the brain? Um, we didn't do that, but I think that would be a good idea. So maybe for instance, just subsetting by like auditory cortex or like earlier vis like visual areas or high level semantic areas or something like that. Um, and I think it would also particularly be useful if for a certain experiment, you're just studying like uh, effects that you would expect in maybe only visual cortex, then maybe you don't really care if SNR is really bad in like precuneus or something like that. You maybe just care if it's really good in visual cortex. But yeah, we didn't do that for this. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, who's which yeah, next you. next group? Uh, next group is Natalie, Julian, and Namrata. You guys can. Cool. 
You guys see the screen? Yeah. Hello. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, conformal RF coils with dry EEG electrodes for multimodal brain imaging. And our group is Julian, myself, and Natalie. Next slide. So um, introduction, so FM, uh, So in this um, project, we were thinking of combining fMRI and EEG. So fMRI uh, collects information about anatomy and indirectly con um, collects information about function as we learned about in the previous presentation. Um, and then EEG direct, um, is collecting direct electrical activity through, uh, through voltage impulses. Um, and then in terms of resolution, fMRI has a resolution, um, temporal resolution of seconds, while EEG is milliseconds. Um, spatial resolution wise, uh, fMRI is on the order of um, millimeters uh, spatial resolution, EEG centimeters on the surface, but the depth can be determined. So there's usually a fall off um, in, in spatial resolution. And then fMRI requires a lot of cost of training, while EEG is fairly easy to use. And so clinically, um, a combination of fMRI and EEG will allow for uh, mathematically robust, non-invasive neuroscience um, studies in functional brain mapping. And clinically, this has been used um, in lesion location prior to surgery for patients with lesional epilepsy. Specifically, um, this was used for cortex mapping for language and motor, um, for, for language and motor uh, parts of the brain. Uh, next slide. Um, so a little bit of background on EEG. So EEG non-invasively records the brain's electrical impulses from the scalp, and it measures voltages on many different channels with respect to a common reference, and has high temporal resolution. So it detects uh, the brain's response to stimuli in basically real time because um, it's on the order of milliseconds. Um, and so spatial, res but spatial resolution, on the other hand, is limited by electrode size and spacing. So if you have very few electrodes spaced very far apart, then you don't know what what neuron firing is causing that voltage um, versus if you have a lot of electrodes and they're really closely placed, um, then you can get a more finer reading. And then, um, so EEG currently is used for epilepsy diagnosis, sleep study, brain computer interfaces, and many other um, uses. And most electrodes used for EEG are wet. So they use a hydrogel or paste to lower um, this electrode skin impedance and achieve larger signals. But this is difficult for use in hair because it takes longer setup and cleanup and um, hair adds to the, that impedance that we're trying to not have. Next slide. And so current systems for, for MR and EEG uh, combinations are commercial uh, MR compatible EEG systems like MagStim EGI. And this uses uh, a wet electro system and it's compatible with whatever coil you already have. And there have been some papers demonstrating simultaneous EEG and MRI, but this requires very careful arrangement of cable and custom hardware software. And usually what ends up happening is one or both of the domains are frequently corrupted. And this is usually the EEG um, because of artifact from the MRI. And to our knowledge, um, nobody has combined tight fitting coils and electrodes on one single device. Next slide. Okay, hey, now I'm going to give a pretty brief introduction, introduction to some of the fabrication methods that Julie and I have been using to work on both of these modalities. So the first thing that we um, use is SLA 3D printing, which you guys are probably familiar with. It's um, a photochemical method, so you can 3D print really fine structures. Um, the second one is thermal forming, which is used in a lot of manufacturing techniques, um, and that's what this video here is showing. So you heat up a piece of plastic until it's really hot and pliable, and then you pull up this platform and draw vacuum so that the uh, plastic conforms to whatever bold you have in it, and then it retains its shape afterward. And then lastly, um, we use a process of electroless copper and also gold plating, which I'll go into a little more detail in later. So um, if you don't know, me and Julian also work with Ana Arias, who um, runs a printing lab. Um, so you might be wondering, why not use screen printing? That's a really high throughput process. You can make a lot of samples in a very short amount of time. Why not print them in thermoform? And the answer to that question is, 
because these films crack a lot when they're subject to the high stress of the thermal forming process. As you can see in that microscopy image, there's a lot of cracking and that reduces the conductivity of the traces. And that actually lowers the quality factor of your resonator, which leads to a pretty poor performance coil. So to get around that, we've developed this electroless plating method, which allows us to deposit our conductive film after the thermal forming process. So the way this works is that we take a piece of polycarbonate plastic and we put some tape on it. We laser cut the pattern that we want. In this case, it would be a head coil, knee coil, whatever. And then we um, sandblast that exposed area in order to make the surface rougher. Then we subject it to a couple of different preparation baths, so a cleaning, bath, a surfactant, which improves the surface energy, and then lastly, a tin and palladium catalyst. After that, we remove the tape, and as you can see in picture E, um, there's the slight color change on the pattern, so you can still see um, how your plastic is being um, aligned with the mold to ensure that it ends up in the right place after the thermal forming process. Then you thermal form it, and lastly, you immerse it in that plating solution overnight, and the copper will only plate on um, the area that has been prepared. Uh, so before we can get into how we manufacture these MRI receiver coils using thermal forming and electroless copper plating, I'll explain how an MRI receiver coil couples to the transverse magnetization produced by processing spins. So after an RF pulse is applied, uh, the spins produce a transverse magnetization that can couple to RF coils via induction. So to ensure that the coil is resonant at the Lamar frequency of the scanner, uh, the coil is tuned and matched by using capacitors, or I guess in, in this case, an L matching network. But for additional patient safety, uh, passive or active detuning is used to prevent RF transmitted RF energy from coupling to the receiver coil while the, uh, while a different, while the transmit coil uh, produces RF energy to excite the spins. So research in MRI receiver coils has shown that increasing the number of channels can help increase the signal to noise ratio of the image. So research conducted here at Berkeley has also demonstrated that the added benefits of building, so there's added benefits of building a body conformal MRI receiver coil that aids in maximizing image SNR while providing patient comfort. And examples of this include, you know, screen printed uh, coils and 3D printed coils. And as an example of the performance of these coils, the figure to the right shows that a three conformal 3D printed net coil produces a higher image SNR when compared to a commercial head coil. So while these, you know, while screen printing and 3D printing allow for the production of body conformal coils, we decided on generating an anatomy specific body conformal coil using electroless copper plating and thermal forming as we can easily plate traces for EEG electrodes on one side of the substrate while plating, plating traces for the coils on the other. So to manufacture these body conformal coils using thermal forming, we can start with a 3D scan of the patient. Uh, from that's, there, that's, we can- That's more what I look like right now than <laughs> what you had in the picture. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny. Yeah, but I guess uh, from there, uh, we can generate a CAD model of the individual's anatomy, which can then be turned into a mold for, a mold for thermoforming by either 3D printing or CNC milling. And in this work, we, milled, we CNC milled a woodstock to generate a mold of Mickey's head. And Karthik, who's a student in Mickey's uh, group, guided me through this uh, CNC milling process. So uh, credit to him as well. So after we have that, we then prep our substrate. So, so at pretty much, uh, we generate a mask for the polycarbonate substrate using Kapton tape and laser cutting. And this, you know, this mask allows for selective catalyzation of the polycarbonate surface and allows us to overlap the coils such that the mutual inductance between them is minimized. And after uh, the surface is catalyzed, we form the substrate over the mold and leave it overnight in the plating bath. And to ensure that it has enough copper deposited, uh, we leave it in the bath for 20 hours. And this gives us a few skin depths at the uh, frequency of interest. So in this case, 128 for 3T. Once, the, once we remove the coil from the plating bath, it was tested for conductivity and the image to the right uh, demonstrates that the traces are conductive. 
So to tune and match the coil, a flexible tunable capacitor was used to shift the center frequency of the resonator. And additionally, a flex PCB was used to house the matching and active detuning circuits. Uh, you can either use nylon screws or low temperature solder uh, to mount these electrical components to the actual surface of the coil. And now that we have kind of explained the fabrication process of our, of our coil, we will now explain how we generate dry EEG electrodes that we can attach uh, to the bottom side of the, to the, at least the concave side of this head coil. Yeah, so likewise, this electroless copper plating method can be applied to 3D printed materials as well. So in a very short amount of time, I was able to make a CAD model and print out this um, pin style electrode shape. So I chose um, these cone shaped pins to give really good structural support with these bulbs on the end to make them more comfortable. A lot of pin style electrodes are really spiky and they can be painful when they are worn. So. Um, if you were to use a more traditional film deposition method, for example, evaporation with this type of um, interesting shape, you would um, get really bad shadowing because the step coverage of evaporation and other um, traditional deposition methods um, are not really suited for like um, interesting shapes like these. So you would get pretty uneven coverage and that would um, make your performance of the electrodes a little bit worse. So um, I basically followed the exact same process that um, me and Julian have talked about before, but in addition, I added two more layers of um, an electroless gold plating step. And those two extra layers of golds, they improve the longevity of this electrode because copper does oxidize over time. And also the gold makes them more biocompatible because these will be in contact with the person's skin. So to kind of test the performance of the coils in addition to having them with the EEG electrodes, the quality factor and the resonant frequency of the coils were measured when the coil was loaded and unloaded. Uh, loaded just means that it's on the body or at least on a phantom and unloaded means the coil is just uh, hanging in free space. And also in addition to having them unloaded and unloaded, we're gonna, you know, we, we place the EEG electrodes on and off the the, the uh, surface, the back surface of the coil. And the perform expense rates that we're going to be looking at today are Q loaded, the Q loaded, Q unloaded ratio, and the resonant frequency. So image SNR can be directly related to the Q loaded, Q unloaded ratio. And the plot on the right shows how the ratio is related to the relative SNR of the image. So if the ratio is low, or at least less than a third, we see little to no added improvement or added benefit in increasing the uh, quality factor of the coil to increase the relative SNR. Uh, in standalone performance, the coil resonates at or near the Lamar frequency at 3T and produces a Q loaded Q unloaded ratio of around a fourth on average. So this is better than the standard ratio of a third, which is desired to achieve body noise dominance. Uh, when the coil is loaded, there is, a there is a small negligible shift in resonance in the presence of an electrode, uh, as shown in the plots and in the table. And in addition to this, when the coil is loaded, we see a large shift, we see a larger shift in resonance of around 657 kilohertz, but this is still very negligible. And any additional shift from this can be corrected by retuning the coil using the uh, flexible capacitor. But as a result, here we have demonstrated the feasibility of generating a combined EEG RF coil. And in our next iteration, we hope to uh, plate traces on the concave side for the EEG electrodes rather than attaching them and having wires uh, hanging off. So another thing that we also wanted to validate is that you can still take an EEG recording in this type of setup. Um, and obviously, while we didn't do this in a scan, because that causes a lot more of other interfering factors that would need to be accounted for, um, when the electrode is simply in the, in, the, um, in the coil on the person's head, we've shown that you can still take um, a good recording and get good contact with the skin. So this is a really simple test that you can do when you take an EEG. Um, when you close your eyes, you should be seeing a peak in what's called the alpha band of frequency, which is around 10 hertz. So you, if you see that, large spike in the orange 
um, plot in the frequency domain, um, that's an indication that this system and this setup is working pretty well. You can see um, a slight difference um, in the time domain. It's a little bit more difficult, but when the eyes are open, you can see that there's um, higher frequency components. And then when the eyes are closed, the frequencies are a bit lower. So um, some further information. So um, there are many artifacts with this technique. So gradient and RF induced artifacts are often present in the EEG. But if the EEG acquisition is synchronized with the MR clock, gradient artifacts are strictly periodic and reproducible, and they can easily be removed um, using moving average artifact template subtract subtraction. So gradient uh, artifact is pretty easily removable. Um, susceptibility artifacts, um, on the other hand, they're not a huge issue because the electrodes aren't implanted, but they could cause some signal loss in skull areas, but um, there's not a clear-cut way to remove the artifact if it's there. Uh, and then pulse artifacts also contaminate EEG, and these happen due, due to um, biomechanical motions. So, so, for instance, like head motion after each heartbeat, scalp expansion inducing motion of electrodes near the superficial arteries, and then the Hall effect because of blood flow. And so all of these combined, they cause, um, they cause artifact. And this is because biomechanical motions are very variable. This artifact is non-stationary and highly variable between successive heartbeats. So it's not exact, it's not very, um, it's not easily removable like gradient induced artifacts are. Um, next slide. Um, so as a conclusion, um, so fabricating a single substrate um, dry EEG slash head coil, it's feasible and it's promising. And this would improve scan SNR while also enabling collection of high temporal resolution EEG signals. So you not only get active uh, functional anatomy, but you also get physiological activity and both at a very good resolution. Um, but integrating the two techniques um, needs a little bit more work, but there are some solutions that have been demonstrated. And a big thanks to Mickey, Ekin, Karthik, and Ryan. Next slide. Yep, and these are all of our references. Uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question. Yes. Any questions? Come on, folks. Yeah, you get credit for asking questions. Oh yeah, sorry, I had a question. So. Um, Julian, you mentioned that the the resonance frequency of the of the coil changes when you load the phantom or when you load the coils with a loading phantom. So would that change when you when you put the coil on the patient and then would you have to like keep retuning for each patient or is it about similar between patients? Uh, so it's generally similar between patients, but because patients especially the head, they, you load it differently every time. What kind of helps you out is that because the Q, the Q loaded is kind of small, that means the bandwidth of the, of the coil kind of increases. So any like any shift in resonance that you get is going to be really small and you'll still, you know, you'll still have, you'll still be able to pick up a decent signal uh, as long as you're near, you know, 127.7. So even, even if the uh, resonance frequency shifts between patient to patient, it's still pretty close to what it needs to be. And because the Q is so low, uh, the bandwidth is large enough to accommodate for that. I see, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the open and closed uh, slide, or eyes open and closed slide. Um, if you're, when you're showing like the, the graph of, uh, yeah, that one, perfect. Um, so when you're showing that for eyes closed, you have like the two, or I guess three peaks there, were you expecting to see that many or just looking for one specific peak? Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, um, it's, I feel like, I don't think the peaks are really what is important. It's more of like the general power in that area. Sometimes when I do these, I get more peaks, sometimes less, but they're higher. It's just, you're looking for more of a general increase. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? 
Uh, I was curious about the, so you talked a lot about how like the ECG permissions are affected by the, um, like the, the MR machine itself. But I was wondering with like all the ECG wires right next to the coils themselves, does that, how does, do you have to account for that at all uh, with the measurements there or is it, uh, is it totally fine with the extra metal even within the coil? Yeah, it seems to be fine because um, in both the unloaded and loaded conditions, we observed pretty negligible shifts in the resonance frequency when there was an electrode with like a, there was also a wire too. It was kind of hard to see in the pictures, but yeah, there was an electrode connected to a wire. Um, and I don't think that if there were more, we just used one, but I don't think that if there were more, um, it would make a big difference. Yeah, and in addition, you can also compensate. Like you can, you can, you can place the electrodes, you can kind of be smart with it and place the coil and electrodes such in a way that the, you can minimize at least the interaction between the two. Okay, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. Is that? Um, we're on time on the previous schedule. So maybe we can speed up a little, just slightly. No. Yeah, yeah you, but they started at four, so I think we're good. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next group, uh, please. Uh, who's the next group? Yeah, Tanner, Cheryl, and Clara. Yeah, I have to say that one thing about uh, EEG removing artifact, it's actually not very easy to remove graining artifacts. Um, in particular, the dynamic range is so strong such that it would eliminate, like you really need a lot of bit of accuracy uh, in order to be able to do that because you have really strong signal on top of very, very small. And so that effect, that can actually, behavior can affect the amplifier. And so, you know, you have to kind of scale down the amplification so you have, you know, the amount of actually signals left out is, um, and so you need like 24 bits or something like that, even even more sometimes in order to be able to uh, remove the signal uh, from the MR. Okay, I guess we can start now. So we're gonna be presenting on deuterium metabolic spectroscopy and the sub name for our project is Stupid Echo, which you'll see why in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. So in our class, we focused a lot on NMR in the context of imaging rather than spectroscopy. So just really briefly, spectroscopy is a technique that takes advantage of the interaction that occurs between hydrogen or carbon atoms and electromagnetic radiation in order to gain detailed information about chemical compounds. So say you have the nucleus of a proton being influenced by both an external field B0 and an internal field BE caused by nearby electrons that actively oppose B0. These electrons cause what is known as electronic shielding. And so the effective magnetic field that the nucleus fields B effect is actually less than B0. So this is the cause of what is known as chemical shift where we see the resonance of certain atoms appear in a somewhat different location than what we would expect in our NMR spectra. Next slide, please. So how do we actually acquire the NMR spectra? Say we have a compound such as propyl chloride in a solvent like water. This molecule has three chemically different carbon atoms labeled A, B, and C. It's exposed to a main magnetic field B0. In order to generate a signal from the spins, you need to apply an RF pulse close to the Larmor frequency. As a result of this, you obtain your FID, which you can then Fourier transform into an NMR spectra for which your chemically different carbons will appear as separate peaks in relation to a reference standard, which is usually a TMS signal. Next slide, please. So when you're looking at an NMR spectra, there are kind of three main things to consider. The strength of your signal is reflected by the magnitude of your peak. So if you have one signal that's significantly stronger than the other signals, you'll be much more limited in your ability to analyze the weaker signals. Another element is the splitting pattern. So there's usually an expected splitting based on the number of nearby protons. However, this expectation gets distorted in complex molecules. 
So the splitting phenomena is also related to the gyromagnetic ratios of nuclei in the molecule. So a lower gyromagnetic ratio will result in less complex splitting patterns. So like in this case, a six peak split would probably be more likely caused by a higher gyromagnetic ratio. And then the other important thing is chemical shift, which just as a reminder, it's essentially a measure of where we're seeing an atom resonate as compared to some reference. So next slide, please. So spectroscopy is based on various nuclei of interest. Depending on the nuclei you choose to tag, you'll see a particular signal which favors the quantification of either hydrogens or carbons in a molecule. So now deuterium is a hydrogen isotope that contains an extra neutron. By injecting a deuterated compound into a patient, deuterium spectroscopy can be used to map metabolism with high temporal or spatial accuracy. So for example, if you look at the picture on the right side, if you have an exogenous glucose label that's deuterated in the sixth position, which is the blue uh, atom there, you can follow the blue dot to see how the deuterated signal moves over the course of the TCA cycle. And then you can relate this to what you observe in the output spectra. Next slide, please. So because of the different elements involved, each type of spectroscopy behaves a little bit differently. So because water is everywhere, protons are super abundant. And in proton spectroscopy, we often see a water peak that's too large in relation to the other peaks. And then for deuterium, because of the presence of a quadrupolar moment, which means um, the charge configuration isn't symmetric around the molecule, and that's shown on the right side. Uh, this is a result of a nuclear spin equal to one. Deuterium actually has a higher sensitivity than the other two spectroscopic methods. So this quadrupolar moment also leads to a lower T1 and T2 relative to proton spectroscopy. Also, deuterium has the lowest gyromagnetic ratio, which leads to a lower Larmor frequency. So the lower Larmor frequency causes deuterium to have a low sensitivity to B0 in homogeneity. And then one other thing that's important to mention is that carbon-13 is technologically really difficult to perform. You essentially have to hyperpolarize your sample prior to injecting it, but once you inject the compound, you quickly lose the hyperpolarized signal. So you end up with a single use signal. This means you can't have MZ recovery. So which type of spectroscopy is actually best? It kind of depends. So next slide, please. So surprising. Yeah. Uh, so the NMR spectra for each method ends up looking quite different from each other. So the top row here shows the spectra from proton spectroscopy. On the left in A, you can basically see how both the water and the lipid signal are of magnitudes higher than the signals obtained from the glutamate and the lactate molecules which in B you can see because that same spectra in A is zoomed in really closely. Uh, we overcome this disproportionate signal strength by using deuterium spectroscopy. So in C, you can basically see here that it's much easier to see the glucose and the lactate peaks. And they're also more detailed than the spectra you see with proton spectroscopy. And then if you look at D with the carbon-13 spectroscopy, you can see that we're getting really detailed information about the lipids. Uh, this can be good or bad depending on your use case. So for example, you don't really care about lipid signals when you're measuring metabolism, which is the primary use case of deuterium spectroscopy. Next slide. Yeah, and so given Clara's background on the utility of deuterium imaging and its potential um, and differences to other nuclei spectroscopy methods, we wanted to take advantage of an awesome NMR facility at UCSF that has a 14T, it's a variant system. Um, and we acquired two deuterated compounds, glucose, which is deuterated in the sixth position and acetate, which is deuterated in the three position. And we wanted to do some just basic spectroscopy tests to show its utility or just why it's like super cool. Um, so uh, using, we wanted to optimize adiabatic excitation pulses given that we we're using a surface coil. Uh, and then using those calibrated excitations, we aim to calculate relative T1 and T2 values. Um, and then we wanted to demonstrate some, some imaging and we used a press um, sequence to indicate like relative H DO and deuterated line widths compared to what you would expect in a H1 spectroscopy setting. 
Um, and here we took extra care about shimming because line width is inversely proportional to T2 star. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned that we were focusing on adiabatic pulses. And the reason is that these pulses are amplitude and frequency modulated pulses that have an advantage of being insensitive to the effects of B1 inhomogeneity and frequency offset, which is super important given um, that we're using a H2 surface coil. Um, and again, surface coils produce highly inhomogeneous RF fields where B1 decreases with distance from the RF coil. Um, and this is the opposite of what you would expect in a generally that volume coils are very homogeneous. So you can see with my sensitivity and um, flip angle equations that um, they're dependent on position and which is indicated by R. So if you look in the panel below, you see an adiabatic pulse and then a square hard 90 degree pulse and a square 180 degree pulse. And you can see that um, the signal and SNR fall off with um, distance from the coil. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so just to kind of give a background because adiabatic pulses were not super intuitive to myself. Um, so in conventional B1 pulse where we consider the general um, rotating frame where B1 is excited along the x-axis um, and at the Lamar frequency, um, this ex excitation rotates the magnetization towards the transverse plane relative to M0, which is at the z-axis. The flip angle is uh, therefore a product of the temporal integration of the B1 magnitude. Um, but in an adiabatic pulse case, you consider a difference reference frame. This is known as the frequency modulated frame. Um, and it's denoted by X prime, Y prime, and Z prime. Um, and this is kind of akin to our homework on um, problem set 10 when we look at B1 mapping. Um, so as you sweep from low frequencies to high frequencies, the magnitude of B1 and delta gamma over, uh, delta omega over gamma, which is the difference between um, the Lamar frequency and the frequency um, at a certain point uh, changes a B effective field. And in this case, the main the main point is that B1 remains fixed during an adiabatic passage. When the frequency of the pulse deviates from the Lamar frequency, a magnetic field with an amplitude equal to delta omega over gamma is encountered along the z-axis. This effective field is the sum of the vector of the longitudinal fields and that B1 field that I referred to um, in the X prime plane. Um, and uh, so this essentially like puts us in a different field, uh, reference plane altogether as we transform the axis from Z prime to Z double prime as we are officially pushing the spins to be effective. Um, for the spins processing within this frequency band, the flip angle will, will be uniform provided that the orientation of the effective magnetic field changes slower to the rotation of M. Uh, the requirement can be satisfied um, sufficiently, at, sufficiently at high B1 amplitude values or slow frequency sweeps. Um, and this is called the adiabatic condition. Um, but just to re uh, put us in the point of reference for the rest of the talk, um, there's three pulses that we could use. An adiabatic half passage, which is AHP, that's an effective 90 degree pulse. An adiabatic full passage, which is effectively 180 degree pulse. And an adiabatic plane rotation pulses, also known as beer 4 which is arbitrary fill angles. So you can do a wide range of excitations. Okay, next slide. And then just to kind of explain kind of our experimental outlook um, on looking at um, T1 and T2 values um, for inversion rate, uh, for T1 values, we used an inversion recovery experiment, um, which is the most robust and accurate method to measure T1 relaxation. Um, this comes at a cost of long acquisition times as um, you start with a 90 degree excitation, then a recovery TR that is long enough to establish a thermal equilibrium magnetization for all of the nuclear spins, which is roughly five times the longest T1 relaxation value. Um, and then um, you then invert the magnetization using 180 degree pulse. Um, and then you calculate a, an inversion time, um, but you can see the relationship with um, T1 in this experiment below. Okay, and then the, the next slide. Um, so there's two methods that we could use to look at uh, T2 values. You can use a Han spin echo, which is just kind of what we covered in class, a simple spin echo sequence. Um, 
the RF pulses are all applying in the same direction, usually X, that includes the 90 and 180 degree excitation pulse. In practice, this method results in a measured T2 values that are a little shorter um, due to cumulative phase errors from rep rep repetitive 180 degree pulses and B1 inhomogeneity, which in this case shouldn't be a big issue because we're using adiabatic excitations. Um, but more generally, next slide. Um, people use a Carl Purcell Mel Boom Gill uh, experiment or CPMG. Um, and this applies the 90 degree excitation in the Y plane and uh, repetitive 880 degree pulses in the X plane. Um, and this is just to approach the inhomogeneity issues and the cumulative phase errors across the axis. The problem for this is that CPMG is not commonly used for MRS or spectroscopy purposes um, because it, it has a typical acquisition time of roughly 100 to 200 milliseconds, which makes the inner echo spacing prohibitively long um, relative to our T2. Um, next slide. Okay, so uh, as mentioned by Tanner, the first thing we need to achieve by using the surface coil is a good power calibration for both the 90 degree and the 180 degree adiabatic pulses. And uh, in this study, uh, we used the adiabatic uh, half passage pulse, aka uh, AHP, uh, as our 90 degree excitation pulse. Uh, to calibrate its Two power. Minutes. Two minutes, yes. Yes. You already, you already is 15. Oh, I'm so sorry. So here's the power calibration for the 90 degree and uh, somehow it gets the plateau around the 58 dB. That's the power we can use for the 90 degree pulse. And uh, here we'll compare the uh, spectral uh, response uh, by using the adiabatic pulse and also the hard pulse, the conventional hard pulse. And uh, apparently we can get a narrow and a more symmetrical peaks from the adiabatic uh, pulse based uh, spouse sequence, which means that we have less uh, phase uh, distortion and uh, somehow, yeah, that's the less uh, basal inhomogeneity we are uh, overcoming. And uh, here we repeat the same thing for the calibration of the 180 pulse of the BF4. Uh, we achieved the uh, uh, MZ, uh, M0 conversion to the Z negative by using the power around uh, 60, 60 dB. But somehow uh, we need to consider more factors uh, as a function of the signal intensity, such as the phase increment during the sweeping of the B effective from the positive to the negative. So actually I want to say uh, it's not a uh, optimal power we get here as 60 degree for, uh, as a 60 dB for the BF4 pulse. So, to bypass such, such kind of uh, complicated problem, uh, we try to get an empirical power for the BF4 uh, sequence, uh, in which we set the BF4 into different power levels and uh, had a look at the fitted uh, T2 decay curve. And uh, by playing around the, those power levels, we think, yeah, 52, uh, 52 dB uh, could be a uh, optimal power. We can go on with our study. So that's the power calibration and by using those powers for 90 degree and 180 degree uh, pulses, we get the T2 measurement for the digital rate of glucose, uh, which is around 23 milliseconds. And here is the T2 measurement for the acetate D3, which is around 44 milliseconds. By using the inversion recovery pulse, we estimate the T1 for D glucose uh, to be around 25 and uh, the T1 measurement for acetate D3 is uh, almost uh, one second, which is sort of surprising to us. So to validate the reliability of our results, we compare our T1, T2 measurement with some published results uh, at, uh, at different field strength. Uh, first here is a big picture about this comparison. Because the quadrupolar moment just mentioned by uh, Clara, we're expecting shorter T1 and T2 from to read the metabolites, which mechanism can be covered in uh, final detail during our question session, uh, question session today. And also because of similar T1, T2 values coming from the due to the metabolites, uh, both around the 50 to 60 milliseconds, we can actually expect a higher SNR, uh, SNR from our uh, steady state imaging, whose signal intensity uh, is a function of 
both flip angle and uh, the T2, uh, T1 ratio. And uh, here we demonstrate T1, T2 measurements of the uh, tutorated, tutorated glucose in the orange boxes. On the left is the result from the literature, and on the right is the result from our own uh, experiment. Uh, as we can see, there is a huge difference in terms of both T2 and T1 measurements. Uh, still, at this moment, we don't have any uh, clear explanation why. And the one case from us now is could be the 180-degree adiabatic tiles we use is not the perfect one. It's not perfect for re for either refocusing or inversion. And then we also put our measurement of T1, T2 for the acetates on the blue box. Unfortunately, no reference values have, have been published yet. And uh, to run, uh, wrap it up briefly, uh, here's some theoretical correlation for the T1, T2 uh, relaxation mechanism of deuterium. Uh, we don't have much today for this, but please feel free to ask questions later. And I also compared the proton and the deuterium spectroscopy profile by using the uh, press on the same uh, low concentration, uh, high concentration uh, glucose phantom. As we can see, we can achieve a cleaner spectral profile from the deuterium NMR results, uh, which has a way more narrow and a sparse peak when compared with the proton spectroscopy. Uh, this is one of the advantages of deuterium NMR, NMR because we have more flexibility to design the deuterated positions for metabolites of interest. And at the same time, for in vivo study, we're able to follow up the real-time conversion of these deuterated metabolites into a downstream uh, metabolic pathways. Okay, uh, and finally, we also calculate the natural abundance. Is it? Do you have, do you have uh, more, like a lot more? Because I that's mean, the last result. You're, you're, you're a lot over. Thanks okay. so much. Thanks. And uh, here's an acknowledgement too. Okay, can you just summarize the result? You might as well. I mean, <laughs> I, so I'll, I'll let you finish the results, but yeah. Yeah, so somehow uh, we have measured the T1, T2 uh, at the funding T uh, machine. And compared with the published uh, published uh, T2 value, uh, values of those T2 uh, rated metabolites, although it has some uh, huge difference, but is something uh, first being done uh, at this moment. And also we demonstrate the uh, cleaner and uh, sparse spectral profile of the T2 and NMR, which is sort of an advantage over the proton spectral spectroscopy. And at the end, uh, we demonstrate the you know, demonstrate the uh, quantification of the natural abundance of the deuterium. That's our result. Thank you very much for attention and the okay. uh, patient. Thank you. Um, I think for the sake of time, we should uh, actually move to the next presentation. Um, who's next? I can. And please, uh, groups, try to stay. Uh, I mean, it's part of the thing is to be able to uh, present your work within 15 minutes and have enough time for discussion. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, we'll be presenting on MR thermometry. So our talk is, uh, there we go, from an MRI technician to a cook, a journey of studying <laughs> heating in MRI. So some background on MR thermometry. It's used for in vivo temperature monitoring during thermal ablation therapy, such as focused ultrasound. It's non-invasive, so we would prefer not to stick a temperature sensor into, this, into the patient, right? And uh, recent developments uh, for MR thermometry also include uh, evaluating SAR. So there are several uh, MR methods um, available, but we'll discuss a few and then highlight the one that we use for experiments. And so eventually, like, the ultimate goal for in vivo thermometry is uh, being fast and accurate. So let's dive into a few methods of MR thermometry. The first is uh, proton density. Uh, PD is proportional to magnetization, which is inversely proportional to temperature. Uh, however, this dependency is pretty weak and uh, requires a high SNR. And a long um, recommendation time is also required to remove any T1 effects. So it's neither fast nor accurate. Another uh, method uh, is using a T1 relaxation. This uh, temperature dependency of T1 is roughly 1% per degree centigrade. So it's a bit better than the PD method. However, to get an accurate T1, we need to use uh, methods such as inversion or saturation recovery, which are pretty time consuming. So again, we want a fast method, so this won't work for us. 
Uh, Brownian diffusion um, for temperature sensing is also a pretty similar uh, temperature or exponential temperature uh, dependency and a slightly better temperature uh, sensitivity than, than T1 relaxation at around 2% uh, percent per degree centigrade. But it also suffers from a long acquisition time as well as sensitivity to motion. So the final method I'll discuss is a phenomenon called proton resonant frequency shift. The uh, off resonance uh, frequency, or the PRF rather, of a molecule is dependent on the local B field. The electrons um, surrounding the nucleus shield the protons and change the effective local B field, which will change the uh, effective resonant frequency. This uh, shielding is temperature dependent as uh, weaker bonds between molecules um, create stronger shielding at higher temperature. Uh, but you might notice that this temperature coefficient of the shielding constant is alpha is only 10 parts per billion. So that's really, really small. Uh, however, if you consider how we uh, measure the temperature difference between um, the signal and uh, our reference, it's um, taking the angle difference divided by the temperature coefficient um, alpha times the gyromagnetic ratio, uh, gamma, B0, and the equatime. So you can kind of think of this as integrating the off resonance um, over a very long echo time relative to the uh, high resonant frequency. So this method is actually pretty sensitive to uh, temperature on the order of 1.2 uh, degree of phase angle per degree centigrade for a 3T scanner. So we can say that this method is uh, pretty accurate and precise. And we can use a fast imaging technique such as a gradient echo, uh, which is what we used in our experiment to measure phase making uh, the PRF uh, phase mapping method the most suitable method for in vivo thermometry. So I'll pass it off to Rebecca to talk about our first thermometry experiment. So to validate using PRF shift to perform MR thermometry, we performed an experiment with the following setup. Hot water was placed inside a plastic container at the ISO center of the MRI machine four. The OSENSA fiber, temp, uh, fiber optic temperature sensor as shown here was set up in the console room and the tip of the extended cable was placed inside the water to monitor real-time temperature change. As temperature drops gradually, we collect the magnitude and phase data of the GRE scan every few minutes. The GRE scan we used was a multi-echo GRE with slice thickness of three millimeters, TR of 100 milliseconds, TE respectively 10 and 20 milliseconds, and a flip angle of 20 degrees. Each scan takes about half a minute, and we used a 19-channel coil, and using the BART toolbox, we extracted the sensitivity map of each coil during reconstruction. As you can see, these are respectively um, the magnitude and phase results of the scans at 46.3 degrees and uh, 36.3 degrees of the same slice and the same echo time. If we take the phase difference, between the two scans, uh, we can get the result on the right side. Um, it had been derived that the change in temperature is directly proportional to the change in phase, and phase change is determined by the water proton shielding coefficient, which is around negative, negative 0 0.01 parts per million per degree centigrade, um, the echo time and the Larmor frequency. Therefore, we can perform a simple, a simple calculation to extract the temperature change. Using the scan data at the lowest temperature as reference, we can see that the, a larger temperature difference between the two scans yield a larger um, phase difference, as shown in the middle column. Eventually, we plotted the estimated temperature at all slices and all echo times and plotted them against the OSENSA data. It can be seen that the prediction across all slices and echo time are consistent, except that at higher temperatures, um, we suspect that this is because during the scan, uh, the temperature difference between the water and the surrounding was too large, that water temperature dropped too quickly. It was for about two degrees. Um, this led to the inaccuracy in our estimation. Mm. However, this data still doesn't align with the OSENSA data perfectly. Literature has reported that the error of such method is usually around one to four degrees. So this is within tolerance. One other possible explanation is that the water proton chemical shift coefficient is not really um, 0 0.01. In our case, um, 0 0.013 actually fits the curve better. 
um, more advanced algorithms have been proposed to both accelerate data acquisition and error correction. For example, for volumetric thermometry, undersampled case based methods such as segmented 3D EPI and case based acceleration methods such as hybrid radiant Cartesian um, 3D stack of stars case based EPI. And even direct estimation of temperature from undersampled case based data have been proposed. Researchers have also attempted to correct chemical shift in thermometry for online compatible computation. Because MR thermometry is prevalent in MR guided high flow applications, which require real time monitoring of local temperature change, we decided to perform experiments that generate local heating. I'll hand it over to Yuhan to talk about the details of the next set of experiments. Uh, all right, heating. Um, heating is relevant to MR safety, as Rebecca suggested, as well as uh, MR compatible therapeutics, such as thermal treatment or tumor ablation. And we were interested in ablation via high food, which deposits energy to a single point in the body. So to replicate this setup, we look into theories of heat generation in the scanner that could um, produce uh, local heating. So generally, there are three mechanisms. First, eddy current. Eddy currents can be generated in uh, each small volume of the conducting material. And uh, sec the second method is to induce back EMF via loops, uh, which essentially uses the Faraday's law. And the induced potential can be calculated from the dimensions of the loop and uh, the intensity and directions of the incident RF field. Um, the third method is to um, store RF energy by resonating the waves along the conductor. A long conductive guide wire or catheter may operate as a dipole antenna. The wire and the conductive media in the environment forms a transverse electromagnetic or TEM waveguide. The TEM waveguide will be partially reflected where the impedance of the waveguide changes suddenly. Um, so at the end points of the wire, the incident RF wave is bouncing back and causing a uh, reflected RF waves to travel back and forth along the longitudinal axis of the wire. And we can find the waves by superimposing all the TM waves. When not at resonance, the waves will uh, mostly cancel each other out, but at resonance, there will um, uh, be a standing RF waves and the electrical energy will be built up along the wire. So when that happens, the strong local electrical field near the guide wire will cause displacement currents in the interface of the wire and the phantom and produce, uh, generates a lot of heat within this layer. And this is the method that will be used um, to generate heat in the scanner. Uh, before using this method Yuhan was talking about, we at first used, um, attempted using a receiver coil. So thanks to Julian, we borrowed um, this coil from him. And if this coil, this coil was tuned to the Larmor frequency of the 3T scanner that we have, in order to reduce the um, heating danger, which uh, might cause the solder joints to burn, we actually cut the traces and then placed two resistors uh, in series with the coil in order to spoil the Q. Unfortunately, um, we weren't able to generate much heating with this method. Uh, we suspect that we actually put, uh, spoiled the Q too much, that it was not uh, generating enough heat. However, even though we were able to generate heat with this and put it inside the phantom, the susceptibility artifacts will still um, make it impossible to acquire accurate phase information. Um, so the next set of hardwares we tried was the coax cable method. Um, so for this was a coax cable that we trimmed to the estimated um, lambda over four length of the frequency that we were operating at. We attached a solenoid to the end of it, um, connecting the outer conductor and the shield. Um, this way, uh, the, the inner conductor and the shield, hoping that the heat will be generated at the solenoid. It turns out that the resistance of the solenoid was about one ohm and it was not enough to generate much heating. Um, the next thing we resorted to was um, replacing the solenoid with a resistor, which was 50 ohms. So this orange line here is the Alsensa um, fiber optic temperature sensor, and this is the coax cable. 
this is just a repetition of the setup uh, that Rebecca described. We use a non-magnetic coax cable and solder a 50 ohm resistor um, between the two um, layers and then uh, use an obsessive optical fiber sensor to um, measure temperature at the 50 ohm resistor. And we tried two different types of phantom for this setup. We tried whole egg as well as water and uh, we will show results for both of the setup in a in the next or next next few slides. So here's the setup. Uh, here's our setup in the scanner. Uh, it's pretty sim It's very similar to the first setup we had. Uh, we put water phantom in a receiver coil and then uh, stuck the thing we built into it and acquired data from the console room. But note that from the corona view, we um, um, deliberately put the setup of resonance to maximize heat generation in this case. So here are our results. Uh, we, we tried to um, find the resonance by changing the cable length. Um, and here's how temperature increment changes versus cable length for each uh, set of experiment or each data, we perform a 2D FSE, which is a one minute and 40 seconds scan to, and then uh, measure, recorded the temperature increment before and after the scan. Then we waited till the um, temperature re restored to um, around 20 degrees and trimmed the wire and repeated the experiment. And as we can see at around 92 centimeters, um, there's a peak. And in fact, that is, also just an interpolation result because we had to hold the scan during the experiment as the temperature was increasing so quickly. And um, <laughs> so from room temperature, which is around 20 degrees, this is probably like 70 degrees, which Oops. is crazy. Yeah. And now because it could increase temperature so much, we were uh, like, why don't we try to cook eggs with this setup? So we put the same thing into egg, um, but apparently it, the resonance has shifted because load really matters to resonance. Yeah, so yeah, if we continue to trim it shorter, we might be able to find it, but we didn't do that. Okay, so going back to um, connecting this back to thermometry, in theory, knowing the temperature change over time and the properties of the phantom, we can calculate and map out SAR using thermometry. And from a safety standpoint, SAR is important. Uh, usually it is predicted by uh, electric, electromagnetic and thermal simulation, stim, simulations in human models or through measurements on phantoms according to the society standard. And one experimental method is uh, the pulse energy method and, and um, which basically just calculate the energy per pulse and average it over TR to find the power and divide it by mass to find SAR. And the second method, um, is, uh, which is more similar to thermometry, is um, to perform uh, calorimetric measurements where uh, people record the temperature increment over time, uh, multiply by specific heat and mass of the phantom, average of, over time to find power, and then divide it by mass to find SAR. The issue with um, those two methods is that it only gives partial body SAR or a point SAR where the sensor is placed. Um, for the calorimetric measurements. And it also depends hugely on the phantom, including tissue geometry, boundary conditions, electrical property, et cetera. So um, if um, the thermometry would come into very handy in this case, because it can produce direct real-time measurements and map out SAR in a 3D manner. Yeah, so that concludes our... Um, presentation. Okay, well, it doesn't really conclude our presentation. So yeah. along the path of um, studying thermometry, we ended up um, dealing with a lot of food in the scanner. So we ended up scanning some stuff, which we wanted people to guess what they are. You, you can just um, unmute yourself and try to guess what this is. Wait, are these all foods? Is this a block of cheese? No. Any Water? other guess? Is it chocolate? What? Yes, it's, oh, it's the nice chocolate. Guess. Yeah. With, um, with, the, with the metal? No, without the metal, that wouldn't give us any signal, right? Uh, maybe. I don't know. It's like shielding, basically. I don't know. Chocolate is yeah. mostly fat. 
Yeah, uh, we, we were wondering why the signal was so low. This was a fast spin echo acquisition. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we also tried something else. So guess what is this? This is a gradient echo. So is you period? Uh no, but I guess close. It this is like a bottle, I guess. Honey? Yes. Wow. Credit <laughs> to you. All right. So you can see the susceptibility artifacts exactly um, where where the where the bottle kind of curves, which creates a big susceptibility problem. Right. That's why shoulders are a problem for, that's a great image, by the way. Can I oh. use it for next classes? Sure, I'll, I'll send them to you. Cool. So lastly, we would like to thank Ikin and Mickey for the support on experiment setup ideas and hardware, Julian for making the receiver coil, Ke for helping us set up the server and Bart, and Anita for bringing the fridge to the scanner as we also imaged ice. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, unless people have Great. questions. Yeah, we have uh, two questions. That's it. We have time. Any questions? I have a question. Um, I'm really curious, how did imaging ice work? You said that you imaged ice? So so we, we were trying to like change uh, temperature locally. So we had a, a container okay. of water and then we put ice in there. Um, okay. It turns out like ice was like a dark spot. Like, yeah, basically. Okay. All right. Uh, I just question. had a question on like, could you could you do this temperature mapping for like a heterogeneous sample where you have like different materials in different locations, or would you have to know like the materials and where they were before doing it? I think you would have to know because it's very susceptible to T2 star effects. Yeah. Got it. Well, what about protons? I mean, it's it's a proton resonance shift. It's not necessarily. Or at least um, the alpha, the uh, temperature uh, dependency on the shielding constant is. Right. So uh, what about fat? Does fat uh, uh, exhibit SPRF? It, it does, but it's a, it's a much weaker um, uh, temperature dependency on, like, it's uh, one order magnitude smaller than water it is. That's right. That's why it's very hard to do PRF shift in the breast without fat suppression. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, next uh, group, I can. Who's next group? Well, next is Daniel. We're we seeing the presenter uh, slides. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Does this presenter slide see it or? Yeah, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Daniel Gabagziabi here and uh, I'll be talking about arterial spin leveling, um, which is a quantification of um, cerebral uh, blood flow. A um, little bit of the background. So um, quantification of cerebral blood perfusion is a, cru a crucial medical parameter to understand the ramifications of both uh, chronic and acute cerebral pathologies. Um, as we know, um, when the human brain amounts to only 2% of the body mass, it utilizes around 20% of the total oxygen consumption. And um, the blood flow uh, to the brain is essential for delivering uh, oxygen and energy substrates, as well as for clearance of uh, metabolic waste products. 
and divisions in the uh, rates of blood flow can provide diagnostic information regarding various pathologies. And cerebellar blood flow is, is especially important in understanding ischemic injury in the brain, uh, to the brain and uh, is, also, is also important in diagnosis and understanding of various um, neurodegenerative pathologies, for instance, in the early stage of uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, uh, other psychological disorders. So historically, this quantification was done using other modalities such as uh, PET, SPEC, or uh, X-ray CT scans. Uh, however, all these uh, methods are invasive as they require the uh, use of exogenous injection of a contrast media or they are uh, almost every one of them are ionizing, radi uh, ionizing radiation. They use ionizing uh, radiation. So um, we also have MRI-based CBF quantification, and the two common MRI-based uh, techniques are DSC and ASL. DSC involves administration of an exogenous inter uh, intravascular contrast agent, which makes it uh, invasive, whereas ASL um, is uh, ASL non-invasively and magnetically levels the endogenous water in blood, uh, so it's non-invasive. So ASL was developed in, in the early 1990s, and it requires no contrast, as I said earlier, and it utilizes arterial water, uh, water uh, proton leveled by the radio frequencies uh, as an uh, indigenous tracer. It's a differential technique in which two acquisitions are carried out, leveling uh, the um, circulating blood protons or the leveled image and uh, leveling the, uh, so it requires you to level the circulating blood protons and image uh, acquisition and it uses a tagged image and control image for differentiation. So uh, there are also three main uh, proton leveling techniques of ASL, the continuous ASL, positive ASL and zero continuous ASL. So the theory and methods of ASL are uh, arterial blood is magnetically uh, leveled using RF excitation and MRI slice is taken in region of interest in brain after some time for diffusion of uh, leveled blood. An experiment is uh, repeated to acquire controlled slice of the same region of interest and difference in um, magnetization between the control and the initial uh, leveled image is proportional to the uh, cerebral blood flow uh, or blood perfusion. And multiple acquisitions are uh, taken and averaged for a desired SN SNR. So the first or the earliest um, technique is continuous SL. Um, this leveling is continuous through a thin slice at the uh, neck level. And the inversion of the magnetization is obtained by the joint application of uh, continuous pulsed RF uh, for about two to four seconds and a magnetic field gradient in the direction of the flow. And it provides higher perfusion contrast than other types of labeling. But the disadvantage of this technique is that it produces considerable um, magnetization transfer effects and it's also, it also has high level of energy deposition in the tissue The pulsed um, ASL, the second kind is, um, it uses a pulse as, as the name depicts and uh, water of the arterial um, blood leveled is leveled with a short adiabatic inversion uh, RF pulses. Uh, and the pulses are about 10 milliseconds and they cover the entire leveling slab and they're efficient in tagging. And the post level de uh, delay period uh, allows for blood to travel into the brain tissue of interest. However, uh, the drawback of this technique is it, the T1 relaxation occurs during this time, and this leads to a lower SNR than the uh, pseudo continuous uh, ASL, which is the third kind of uh, ASL. So um, there are various techniques uh, or two kind of groups of uh, uh, pulsed ASL. Uh, based on uh, according to the zone of leveling and with respect to the slices, symmetrical methods and asymmetrical methods of the three mentioned on the left uh, picture here, the APSI and PCOR are uh, asymmetric, whereas FAIR is symmetrical uh, positive ASL. 
So it Ecoplanar uh, imaging and signal targeting with alternating radio frequency or EPSAR alternates between acquiring a tagged image and a controlled image. Um, the tagging pulse sequence starts with a 90 degree slice selective saturation pulse applied at the location where the perfusion measurement is um, needed. Uh, this pulse saturates the spins in the slice location of interest, providing some immunity to any um, perturbation that can be um, caused by the subsequent tagging pulse. And following the saturation uh, pulse, a spoiler gradient is typically used to deface the magnetization. Uh, and it can be noted that uh, the spoiling uh, gradient lobe is bridged with the um, slice selection gradient lobe. And after the saturation pulse, it's associated and, and it's associated spoiler, especially selective inversion pulse, that's the tagging pulse, inverts spins with an, um, a tick slab proximal to the imaging slice. Um, PCOR is uh, a, a variation of an AP star, but it uses a control sequence. Uh, it, so its control sequence is different than the, that of uh, AP star. The advantage of PCOR is it's um, that uh, the asymmetry in uh, magnetize, uh, magnetization transfer effects is compensated in in, EP, in PCOR, but not in EPSAR. And the disadvantage of uh, PCOR is, however, that it's less robust against eddy current effects than EPSAR because the control sequence uses a different gradient waveform from the tagging sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, the last kind is the FAIR or uh, flow sensitive alternative, alternating inversion recovery. It employs a frequency selective inversion pulse with and with, uh, without an accompanying slice selection gradient to produce the tagged and control image. Similar to EPSAR, the inversion pulse is typically adiabatic with a bandwidth of about uh, one to five uh, kilohertz. However, unlike the EPSAR, um, the inversion pulse of the control and tagged image have the same carrier frequency. The last kind is uh, the pseudo continuous uh, ASL, which is a hybrid of the continuous ASL and pulsed ASL. It utilizes a long train of uh, very short RF pulses to level spins in a narrow band. Um, and the inflowing blood is continuously inverted as it crosses the leveling plane. And the phase of every other pulse is shifted by 180 degree. And this allows us to acquire control image and it's less sensitive to uh, tag dispension or than the uh, pulsed ASL, or it's it has a lower tagging efficiency than the pulsed ASL. However, it has a higher SNR than uh, pulsed ASL and is ideal for clinical uh, imaging. So the image acquisition that we use in um, ASL is as uh, the, leveling effect is weak. Many repetitions of leveled and controlled paired images have to be acquired and average to ensure adequate SNR, as I mentioned earlier. And EPI is preferably used, preferably used uh, due to its benefits uh, satisfying SNR and rapid acquisition that limits the movement artifacts. And the disadvantage with this is presence of distortions in the regions of high uh, susceptibility. And usually, um, 2D GRE or uh, gradient echo or fast spin echo um, are used, but uh, ultra fast single shot 3D sequences can be used by combining the gradient echo and fast spin echo acquisitions to, uh, or rare can also be used to improve, to have uh, improved image qualities that has a better SNR, better cover and fewer magnetic susceptibility artifacts than the 2D to the uh, API. It also uh, facilitates the elimination of the signal from the static tissue. Um, CBF is uh, also quantified using this uh, formula here. Um, the signal from a fully relaxed blood spin or the PD image in the, in the, Im uh, in the uh, picture here uh, is used to scale the absolute units of CBF. The lambda, uh, scales tissue intensity to that of blood. Tau, um, I don't know if you can see, uh, tau is here. Tau is uh, the leveling duration and alpha um, is leveling efficiency and it depends on which technique you use. 
and uh, whether it's 2D or 3D. Uh, the clinical application or the clinical significance of ASL is very vast and it can be used in almost all cerebral pathologies uh, and even in research. So um, almost the most common cerebral pathologies like brain tumors, uh, such as gliomas, ischemia, vascular pathologies, uh, traumatic brain injuries, cerebral, cerebral vascular diseases, almost all of those pathologies can be, uh, uh, it can be used in those all uh, pathologies. Uh, in summary, uh, puzzle or uh, pulsed ASL is a lower, has a lower SNR um, than the PCASL due to the post-level delay. Um, the longer the delay, uh, the lower the SNR. So in practice, the benefits are not as substantial. Uh, the inversion efficiency of puzzle, uh, uh, pulses are higher, uh, but PCASL leveling has a higher, uh, is sensitive to off resonance effects, which causes signal loss and can cause hypoperfusion. Um, and there's also the chance of arterial transit artifacts in. So the limitation is, uh, although we have, we can reliably and quantitatively measure CBF, there are drawbacks, the subjection motion, partial volume effects, and uh, the SAR or the exposure due to RF energy deposition are also some of the limitations of ASL. And these are some of the common artifacts that we see in um, ASL. And with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, both Professor Miki Lasting and uh, our GSI Iki Karasan. Um, these are the references I used and uh, any questions? Any questions? Does this method use any synchronization with the heartbeat or is that not an important consideration? Uh, so this is a literature review, but I don't, I have not read any uh, synchronization um, with the heart because it's usually done with, um, I don't know, uh, I, I may uh, ask the professor here. <laughs> no, usually they're not. Yeah. It, it takes about like a one or two seconds till the blood reaches and, you know, uh, goes into the, yes. uh, into vascular. And then that, that's a few blood, uh, that's a few actually cardiac cycles. Um, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. I was wondering if like contrast agents are ever used with these types of things like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, if um, yeah, I'll start with that. Um, is it uh, ever, or if it is, then when is it used? So it's using uh, the blood water as a contrast agent or as a tracer here. So no contrast agent is used in ASL. In fact, right. let me add that it often it. Uh, it's a non-contrast way of measuring perfusion. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at uh, like uh, disease states, like you mentioned tumors, are you just looking at temporal signal versus like a known healthy area of the brain? Because it's very selective on region, right? Yes, yes, that's that's um, that's the way you do you do it, I, I guess, yeah. Any more questions? So among, actually I have one. So among all the techniques you present, which is the one that is actually currently mostly used right now in clinical practice? Uh, it's the pseudo continuous um, that's used, the preferred yeah. technique. Yeah, it's called, uh, so uh, it's called P-Castle. Uh, a lot of people yeah, in, the, are in yeah. the field call it P-Castle. Um, and mm -hmm. that, that sometimes throws you away. It's like P-C-A-S-L, p, -C -A -S -L, p you know, so that's, that's how they actually mm -hmm. call it. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, do we have more? one more? Okay. We're done? 
we're done. Yeah. Oh, wow. That was it. Yeah. I have proofs. Okay. So hold on. Uh, if you all uh, just uh, show your picture for one second, I'll take a screenshot if you don't mind. It would be nice to have a, uh, uh, a nice memory of this uh, class. Hold on. Uh, selection. Okay, ready? Oh, no, no. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Don't move, don't move, don't move. Why are you moving? <laughs> Pretend you're in an MR machine and you're getting a head scan. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you. It's been a pleasure of having this class uh, and having you um, and uh, listening to all your presentation. It was just uh, wonderful. And actually, just one thing I want to say is that if you just look at the vast differences between just the topics of presentation, I mean, they're all related to MR. But you go one from, you know, machine learning and, you know, fabrication and temperature mapping and then you know sequences and it's just so vast and it's just like a single field in some ways but it's really isn't so um hopefully that gave you kind of at least i mean it's just one of the reason by the way i became an mr scientist is because i could not commit to any field like i when i started my phd i was just i was just not sure what i want to do and I was looking at computer security and I was looking at, you know, uh, low, um, low frequency uh, radar. And I was just talking to a lot of faculty optimization. And uh, I took a class on medical imaging and then I realized, oh, wait, I, you could be in the same field, but you could potentially not commit to anything and you could do whatever you want within that field. And so that's, that's actually some, some advantages to that. So I've been in the field for, I don't know, since 2002. So it was almost, geez, almost 19 years. Uh, and every time I just learned something new and this just MR just doesn't stop giving. So, you know, um, I, I, I remember in 2003, somebody told me, it's like, I, like I went to the first ISMRM conference going, well, why, why are you? Why are you going to this? I mean, MR has been around for, you know, since the 80s. So it's like already 25, and it's an old field. So why, why? I don't know, but that was 20 years ago. And I mean, I'm still amazed by what things you could do. So um, hopefully you learned a little bit about MR. This really was the basic course. I mean, there's so many things to learn. Uh, and you've probably seen that within the presentation. Um, my plan is to actually try to give a more advanced class next uh, next year in the spring. So hopefully some of you may want and may be able to take it. And I appreciate any feedback of type of topics that you'd be interested in hearing. Um, and I may consider them. It depends. <laughs> so thank you, uh, everyone. And I the just before finishing, I just want to uh, thank Ekin for it's just amazing work as a GSI uh, that she's done here. Pretty much, I felt completely disconnected from the class because Ekin was just doing everything, and uh, it was uh, it was just an incredible uh, pleasure working with you. So thank you so much, Ekin, uh, for doing uh, great work, great work in this class, and I, I'm sure everybody would appreciate. It. In particular, because everybody would go to you as opposed to come to my office hours, um, as usual. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Mickey. Yeah, thank you all of. Thank you everyone too. And I actually did learn a lot through this class as well with all of you guys. So uh, it's been a great pleasure being here. So thanks, thanks everyone. Yeah. All right, this, uh, this concludes uh, close exam <laughs> on the scanner. You do close exam and then it closes. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully you all get, uh, I mean, uh, some grade soon. So please submit your uh, uh, stuff that you need to submit, the Wikipedia pages and so on and so forth. For those who did uh, a uh, review or non implementation base, so please submit your uh, Wikipedia. And uh, yeah, nice.
<laughs> Actually, I saw it in, in another class. Someone else had it. I had to get it. So where, where did you get it? Uh, in 206 robotics class. Someone got it, knew you from undergrad, and I don't know where they got this video from. <laughs> I don't even remember which which class was it. Jeez. Can you send it to me? Sure. Wow, that's nice. I'll, I'll, I don't know where I have it. I'll, I have I'll it. Just put it. Find it. That's crazy. Who's this? What? It's freaking insane. Don't don't <laughs> take class from this faculty ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day, and the rest. And follow the balloon. Balloon is uh, is uh, still making it in Mont uh, Wyoming right now. Thank you. This meeting. Bye. Stop recording. <laughs>